the story of writing, astronomy, and law. The story of civilization itself begins in one place. Not Egypt, not Greece, not Rome, but Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is an exceedingly fertile plain situated between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. For five millennia, this small strip of land situated in what is today Iraq, Kuwait, and Syria fostered innovations that would change the world forever. Inhabited for nearly 12,000 years, Mesopotamia's stable climate, rich soil, and steady supply of fresh water made it ideal for agriculture to develop and thrive. About 6,000 years ago, seemingly overnight, some of these agricultural settlements blossomed into some of the world's first cities. In the period between 4,000 and 3,100 BC, Mesopotamia was dotted with a constellation of competing city-states. At one point, they were unified under the Akkadian Empire and then broke apart, forming the empires of Assyria and Babylon. Despite near-constant warfare, innovation and development thrived in ancient Mesopotamia. They built on a monumental scale, from palaces to ziggurats. Mammoth temples served as ritual locations to commune with the gods. They also developed advanced mathematics, including a base 60 system that created a 60-second minute, a 60-minute hour, and a 360-degree circular angle. The Babylonians used their sophisticated system of mathematics to map and study the sky. They divided one Earth year into 12 periods. Each was named after the most prominent constellations in the heavens, a tradition later adopted by the Greeks to create the zodiac. They also divided the week into seven days, naming each after their seven gods embodied by the seven observable planets in the sky. But perhaps the most impactful innovation to come out of Mesopotamia is literacy. What began as simple pictures scrawled onto wet clay to keep track of goods and wealth developed into a sophisticated writing system by the year 3200 BC. This writing system would come to be called cuneiform in modern times and proved so flexible that, over the span of 3,000 years, it would be adapted for over a dozen different major languages and countless uses, including recording the law of the Babylonian king Hammurabi, which formed the basis of a standardized justice system. But Mesopotamia's success became its undoing. Babylon, in particular, proved too rich a state to resist outside envy. In 539 BC, the Persian king Cyrus conquered Babylon and sealed his control over the entirety of Mesopotamia. For centuries, this area became a territory of foreign empires. Eventually, Mesopotamia would fade, like its kings, into the mist of history, and its cities would sink beneath the sands of Iraq. But its ideas would prevail in literacy, law, math, astronomy, and the gift of civilization itself. All right, this is Daniel Simon, of course, at Baton Rouge Community College. I, of course, want to welcome you back uh, to my History 1113 class. Of course, I showed you a little video clip um, on ancient Mesopotamia, uh, which I have posted on my YouTube channel. If you want to go back and look at it again. Uh, but anyway, uh, of course, uh, this is, I guess, week two um, we're in for this class. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, we had that um, week last week, no classes because of uh, the hurricanes and all that. So hopefully we can catch up to uh, where we want to be. Uh, of course, this week I will be mostly covering ancient Mesopotamia. Uh, today, I think, is like mostly early part of it, uh, mostly dealing with the Sumerian culture. Then later in the week on Wednesday, I will be getting into covering more into like the later part of the Mesopotamia, up to that part they were talking about around when the Persians come in. So anyway, uh, 
Of course, start with a few reminders here uh, for the semester. Of course, as you know, you can see here, I do have an important uh, announcement I do have on Canvas right now, uh, which of course is the Canvas quiz number one on prehistory. Uh, we were supposed to get that last week, but because of the storm, I kind of postponed it. But I have posted that to quizzes, which that'll be due on Monday, September 7th, and it's worth 100 points. Uh, looks like you have a time limit on it uh, for that assignment and you're allowed two attempts uh, for it. So make sure you look over the quiz, but also look at, of course, the PowerPoint lecture I have with that, along with my lectures I have from week one uh, on my YouTube channel. So you do have um, both versions. I'm not sure which one was the best one. Maybe the second one was better. I think the first one had more views, but um, if you want to look at both of them, fine. Uh, of course, this is my second lecture on Mesopotamia today. Uh, I kind of messed up on the first one. I did leave off some um, review material, which I'll cover uh, in this class. But I think I forgot just one slide, I believe it was, which was on the Sumerians. But I'll, I'll get to that today and try to get that finished. Um, but anyway, a um, few announcements before I get started, though, besides the quiz. Uh, don't forget... Uh, if anybody still has that contract policy page, uh, send that to me. I don't know if anybody still hadn't done that yet, but get that to me if you haven't. Uh, also, book reports. You know what book you want to do for your book report. Uh, so send that to me. Email me. If anybody's interested in the uh, Veterans Oral History Project, let me know. I've got about nine or ten people that have signed up for it so far. So anybody else want to do it, just email me. And, you know, Try to get it done because it's worth a lot of bonus points if you're interested in that. So anyway, um, of course, uh, StreamYard, anybody wants to come into the uh, broadcast booth with me, of course, there's the link to it. Nobody in here right now. Anybody wants to come in, you can. I think it was a bunch of people that was in the first one. That's fine. Uh, if you're on YouTube, you can say hi. Um, so uh, good afternoon. So I hope you all are doing good uh, today. Um, we're going to, of course, talk about Mesopotamia, so ancient Mesopotamia. So anyway, uh, I do have a PowerPoint slide that I do have, uh, which I can pull up uh, real quick here. Here you go. Open up the screen here. I have been making revisions to it. I'm kind of working on this right now, but um, I think I've got it. Pretty much revised. I have revised it a few times already this today, I think, <laughs> even because I think it was a few mistakes and I had to fix. But I think I've got it now, of course. But um, so anyway, we're going to talk about ancient Mesopotamia. And um, yeah, ancient Mesopotamia is one of the oldest civilizations that first developed. Uh, hey, Dallas. Hey, Casey. Uh, and um, goes back, and there's a, kind of a debate about how old it is, but I think most people seem to think it goes back to like eight to 10,000 BC. So you're looking at 10, 12,000 years ago uh, when Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia started. And I think we already know from pre, the prehistory lecture what Mesopotamia means. Uh, but if you go to that next, uh, this is of course the main slide in here, of course talking about the origins of Mesopotamia uh, of course, we already talked about before previously from, I think, the prehistory lecture, we had talked about how Mesopotamia meant the land between the rivers. And we already know the two rivers, right, uh, which are the Tigris over here and, of course, the other one, which is the Euphrates River. So you have both these rivers here. And, of course, it's located now mostly in Iraq, although the rivers themselves start kind of up in Turkey and Syria. Uh, you got Turkey up here, Syria over here. And they drain down. Uh, they actually joined at one point down at the bottom of Mesopotamia into what is Kuwait, which is where the Persian Gulf is. So that's about the area where the land of Mesopotamia was, of course, in ancient times. And um, the name itself has been around. Like the word, the word ancient, uh, ancient Mesopotamia uh, goes back to uh, the Greeks. The Greeks were the ones that first coined the name. Uh, and uh, there was a writer named Arian, which is right here. Arian was a writer 
Greek writer that wrote almost 2,000 years ago about uh, Alexander the Great. Uh, the one I can uh, put on the screen, hey, Chelsea. Uh, but the uh, name of the uh, book that he wrote was called The Anabasis of Alexander. The Anabasis of Alexander. It was one of the first books to really mention the word Mesopotamia. Um, and, um, of course, uh, Arian went on to write mostly about how Alexander conquered the Persian Empire. And Arian was trying to separate, I guess, the region of Iraq, which was to the west of where Iran was. Because, you know, Alexander would go in and, you know, conquer Persia and Iran and all that. And uh, so that's where the, you know, the name originated from. And so for a long time, even up to, I want to say, the 1800s, 19th century, whatever, uh, people, I think, still use that word Mesopotamia uh, until the word Iraq became more popular, uh, which I'll explain where the name came from later. Uh, also, um, you look at the um, this other slide I've got. Let me see down here. Uh, there's another nickname that they sometimes call the region of Mesopotamia, which is the Fertile Crescent, as you can see right there, Fertile Crescent. Uh, the, the term Fertile Crescent um, was, uh, um, was a term uh, that was originated by this um, archaeologist. I'll put its name up here for you. His name was James Henry Breasted. And Breasted was a um, he was an arch American archaeologist who I think was at the University, I want to say of Chicago, back in the 1910s, and he came up with the idea of the term um, fertile crescent, and he was trying to explain all the fertile valleys that made up the region around Mesopotamia. So it included like the Tigris River, uh, the Euphrates River was in it, and then also there were other rivers too. He threw in there too the Jordan River, which is around where Israel Jordan is, and also Egypt, too. So pretty much in that map, you go back to it's like all the area over here, that green, went all the way down to where Israel, Jordan is over here. They do include like the Delta area, like around where, you know, Egypt is and the Nile and all that uh, as part of the same Fertile Crescent area. And all these areas were areas where some of the first great civilizations started. Like you got the Sumerians right here. Babylonians, right here. Cadians, right here. Assyrians. You got the Phoenicians. You got the um, Israelites, Jews later. Uh, and of course, Egypt, Egyptians down here. So all these great civilizations pretty much were in these fertile valleys. And uh, they first learned how to, you know, grow crops like cereal crops and so on, like barley, wheat. That became the staple crop that helped you know, develop their civilization later. So it's kind of talking about, you know, those terms. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the other term they also talk about uh, is cradle civilization. That's a common name, you know, that they use to describe Mesopotamia because it's kind of seen as the birthplace of where the first civilizations were uh, with the Sumerian one supposedly being the oldest and so most in that area, like in red, uh, but you're looking at right here, it's about the area of where mostly these civilizations got started. So Mesopotamia is kind of an area that's kind of between Iran, which is over here, and then you got the Syrian desert in Jordan that's over there. So that's about right there. So, um, yeah, and of course, I didn't talk about the term Iraq. I'll mention that right now uh, before I forget about that. Uh, but Iraq is another name, uh, which is the more modern name uh, that they call um, e um, Mesopotamia. Uh, the word, the name Iraq originates uh, from the, um, it comes from the name um, uh, Iraq. And it's kind of weird, but it's from the Sumerian uh, city. That's called the same thing. It's pronounced different ways. I think, of course, today they call it um, Iraq. Some people call it Uruk, I think was maybe the original name that they dubbed it. That's where the name came from over time. And I'll get to it later 
Uh, Iraq was a famous legendary city of the Sumerians where the king Gilgamesh came from. You've heard of the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, that was his city he, he ruled over. And uh, they think that was the greatest city of the Sumerians and might have been the first real major city that existed uh, at one point. And uh, so that's the origin of the, you know, where the name, you know, came from, uh, where they use the word Iraq or Al-Iraq, which is what they call the Republic of Iraq today. So that's the name they use that kind of replaced Mesopotamia um, over time. Uh, oh, biblical stuff, too. Yeah, I, I usually talk about that, too. I mean, talk about Mesopotamia, because there's a lot of biblical stories that are connected to our, um, Mesopotamia. The most famous, of course, is the Garden of Eden story, uh, which is mentioned by a lot of different people besides the Israelites or Jews. Uh, the Sumerians kind of mentioned kind of a similar place that's like a paradise in the Persian Gulf region, which they called it uh, Dilmun, D-I-L-M-U-N. And um, so the Garden of Eden is a famous story in the book of Genesis. So there's a lot of parallel stories which are very similar to that in the Bible. Of course, the flood story, you know, the story about the flood, like Noah's Ark, you've heard about in, in of course, in the book of Genesis, uh, the Bible. It's probably the most famous story, you know, associated with um, Mesopotamia and its connection with that region. And yeah, there's a lot of different flood stories that are mentioned by the different peoples of Mesopotamia. The Sumerians, you know, have the Epic of Gilgamesh, and Gilgamesh has a parallel story uh, that kind of follows the whole Noah story. So it's kind of similar to that. And I'll mention later about the Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel is another story which is, you know, very popular uh, in Mesopotamia. Uh, and... Um, of course, it's mentioned in the Bible, I think Genesis 11. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of different like step pyramid type towers being built by uh, Mesopotamian people. Sumerians built some and other groups. I think all the way down to, I want to say Nebuchadnezzar, they were building those kind of ziggurat towers. And so stories like that are, you know, you know based in that region. Uh, and I think sometimes some people even throw in the story of um, Abraham in the book of Genesis, because Abraham originated from southern Iraq, where the city of Ur was, uh, which we'll get to later, one of the first Sumerian cities. Uh, so there's kind of a deep connection to that, too, um, as well. Now, you can see in this um, slide here that, um, yeah, Mesopotamia is kind of like a crossroads. You know, it's like between multiple continents. It's a lot of trade routes going in and out uh, of that region. Uh, if you go to this uh, slide or any of the slides, really, uh, you can see how you got Asia over this way, uh, Europe's over this way, west of Turkey. You get Turkey up here, but you know, you get pretty much to the northwest. You've got Europe. Uh, to the southwest, you've got you know um, Africa and Egypt down here. So you got the Egyptians coming up the coast. Hittites up here coming down at one point, Persians over here coming into Iraq. So all these different people kind of, you know, converging on that one area uh, because of the fertile valleys uh, that are there and all the trade routes running through it. And so, yeah, Mesopotamia is very famous for a lot of constant wars uh, that, are, that are, have been there, still are today. Uh, and so there's constant cases of multiple civilizations just conquering each other, you know, one after the other, which we'll kind of talk about later. And it's famous for that. So now, um, yeah, there's different various peoples that settle in Mesopotamia. They usually break it down into two main groups. Uh, most of like Mesopotamia is dominated by Semitic peoples down to about the time of King Nebuchadnezzar, which would be like the sixth century B.C., uh, and Semitic peoples are uh, mostly language-based peoples uh, that mostly live like in the southwestern part of Asia, which would be from like the Arabian Peninsula down here uh, all the way up to where Syria is. So Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, Israel, uh, 
where Saudi Arabia is and all this area here, that's where all your uh, Semitic people originate from. So Southwestern Asia, most of these peoples speak a language uh, which is mostly written um, left to right on the wrong slide. And um, yeah, left to right, uh, you know, the main ones today are Arabic and, of course, Hebrew. Arabic and Hebrew are the main Semitic languages. Uh, other ones you may have heard of are um, Aramaic, of course, as well. Uh, Phoenician is another uh, Semitic language. Uh, basically, the um, Akkadians, Babylonians, Assyrians, Chaldeans, another one too, uh, are all considered like what they call Semitic peoples. Sumerian, they're not sure what their origin is, probably before that, uh, but that's the most of the Semitic peoples that populate the region. Most of the early states that control most of Mesopotamia, most of them were Semitic down at the time of, like I said, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, then there was another deal where uh, these other peoples came in later. Indo-Aryan, Indo-European peoples eventually came in and took over Mesopotamia as well. Uh, there's examples of those. Uh, I guess the ones that are the most famous. You got the Hittites up in um, Turkey, like ancient Turkey. Uh, Hittites were a type of Indo-European people that may have come out of Eastern Europe. We'll get to them later. So they're up here. They at one point sacked Mesopotamia. And then you got the Persians in Iran. Uh, they're a type of Indo-Aryan people that they think originated from somewhere north of Iran, close to Russia. Uh, and they think most of these really Caucasian peoples, I guess they are later called, uh, they think originated from central Eurasia, close to southern Russia. Uh, so they later take over the region. Like the Persians will come in and you know conquer Iraq in the sixth century, and then later the Greeks, Romans, and others that are in Europe will even converge and take over the region, also as well. So uh, mostly the Indo-Aryan or Indo-European peoples control the region later, up until like modern times when eventually the Arabs kind of take back more control, you know, like they have now. So it's kind of talking about the differences of the different peoples that live there and settled there. Now, we need to go ahead and move on, and I'm going to talk about also the uh, what they call the early Sumerian culture. That you see, they call it Aryan Sumerian culture or sometimes called Air, uh, early Mesopotamia culture. Uh, basically, early Mesopotamia is consisted of um, mostly those three civilizations, Sumerians, Akkadians, and Babylonians. Uh, and later, the Akkadians merged with the Sumerians. Sometimes they're called Akkadian Sumerian. Uh, in the previous lecture at 10, I didn't quite get to the Babylonians. It's just too much material. But I'll get to that more on Wednesday. Uh, but um, they're around for a while. You know, you can see down to about 1600 BC or so, somewhere in that range, roughly, that they control up to the time of maybe um, Hammurabi's dynasty and all that. And uh, but the one that's the most famous, of course, is the Sumerians uh, who developed in the region that's called Sumer, which is like in southern Iraq. And um, Sumer is considered the Sumerians is considered the first and the oldest civilization uh, to develop, uh, maybe the first oldest in the world. Uh, and the dating of their civilization is kind of debated about it, but. They do think that the Sumerians came into Iraq sometime between the three and four thousand millennium BC period. So three to four thousand BC is when they entered um, Mesopotamia and Iraq. And they're not sure of the origins of the Sumerians. So they're not sure about that. Some people think they came from Asia or something like that and migrated in. Uh, what we do know is they began developing these cities or city states. Uh, that populate the southern part of Iraq today. It should be down here, kind of below Baghdad. Uh, and uh, they're kind of located right above Kuwait, which is down here. They developed like dozens or so of uh, different city-states, which were based on agriculture, like farming, mostly just growing like cereal crops, 
and also based it, probably based it also on pastoralism as well. But um, in that picture, you can see in that slide, you can see those are like the main city states that were the most famous that are well known today. Uh, the one on the bottom, which is Eridu, is probably considered the oldest one. I think there's a debate about that, uh, but they think that one might date back further than any one. Uh, Eridu is mostly like ruins today, and I believe it's located near what is Basra in southern Iraq. Uh, Ur, which is above it right here, Ur, uh, of course, uh, is um, of course famous because that's where Abraham came from. Uh, and of course, they found ruins there, which they've, of course, rebuilt, which I'll show you later. That was considered a pretty famous city uh, as well. It's located near Nazaria. And in Iraq, which is right here, of course, is the most famous of the Sumerian cities. Uh, that one was considered the largest one. Maybe up to 80,000 people lived there at one point. Uh, and of course, I told you that was the famous city of King Gilgamesh in the famous epic poem, Gilgamesh, um, that people have read probably before. And it's also the origin of where the name Iraq came from. So it's usually pronounced Iraq, how they say it. But I think sometimes they used to pronounce it, like I said, Uruk may have been one of the original names. Although I think the Sumerians had their own name of it. I think Uruk was the Akkadian name of how they said it. So uh, anyways, kind of talking about um, some of these uh, city-states, which like I told you were agricultural-based um, as a whole. Now, let me get into and talk about technology, uh, of course, something that the um, Sumerians were uh, kind of known for. Uh, of course, you saw in that video I showed you earlier that the biggest thing that the Sumerians were known for was cuneiform. Um, and um, cuneiform is a type of uh, Sumerian language system that they think was developed by them something like five, 6,000 years ago. So it was considered the first writing system. Uh, you see from this picture here, here's a cuneiform tablet. Uh, the name cuneiform means wedge-shaped, and it's called that because of the fact that uh, when they would use a stylus to indent like the marks in the clay tablets you're looking at here, it would create a wedge shape or a kind of a triangular looking shape. And so I think it was in like early modern times, I think, I want to say 18th century, I think they started using that term uh, to describe the actual language system, cuneiform, and the name stuck. So they called it um, cuneiform, wedge shaped. And... Um, so they would take these tablets and I guess they'd dry them out in the sun or whatever, you know, be kind of like a, it's almost like a primitive iPad, I guess you could say. Uh, and um, the actual languages was complicated. Uh, at one point they may have had 800 symbols they may have used. And it was a kind of a combination of like logograms or some people call it ideograms that they would use with some kind of a phonetic type alphabet. Because over time it was like, mostly symbols, and then as it progressed, you know, its use down to the time of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, it became more like a alphabet, but it was very cumbersome. And um, what happened was like when Phoenician came in later, the al Phoenician alphabet, they had replaced it, you know, which was more simpler. And so it kind of went out of fashion. It took them people years to figure out how to, you know, translate it. Uh, there aren't that many, uh, well, there's a lot of tablets that have been found. Uh, of course, it varies on that, but you know, half a million to two million. I'm not sure the exact amount of tablets that have been found over the years, but maybe up to 100,000 have actually been translated or published, mostly just a bunch of records. And uh, there's very few cuneiformists that can actually read cuneiform, maybe just a few hundred, uh, believe it or not. So, so it's a very complicated you know, writing system. And it's kind of comparable to like uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs. And some people think that it, hieroglyphs may have been influenced by it, they believe. This thing kind of shows you like how they may have evolved from like maybe an object to like an ideogram or logogram at one point. Uh, what are some other things that the Sumerians were known for? Oh, they've, 
they invented a lot of things, uh, the Sumerians. Um, I think they're usually credited with like the wheel, which led to the chariot. Glass, uh, bronze smelting is another thing they usually give them credit for. The sailboat. Uh, they were the first to have irrigation, the first cities. Uh, they may have developed like an early plow, maybe like a bronze plow, I believe. Uh, they had mathematics, architecture, calendar system, astronomy. You saw that in the video. They talked about how they had like a calendar system of 12 months to it. They had seven days a week. They knew about the minute. They knew about the hour. They knew about all this stuff already uh, at that point. So they are very well advanced as a, as a um, civilization. Uh, they didn't, with mathematics though, which is kind of weird, they didn't know about the zero. They didn't understand that. Uh, as an example. Um, of course, one of the most famous is beer, which is still around the day. Uh, beer type of alcohol was something they were believed to have invented. You know, I didn't mention in the first uh, lecture, but they actually have cuneiform tablets that have beer recipes that go back, I think, beyond 3000 BC. So it was kind of <laughs> very interesting about that. So uh, organized religion, that's another thing they're they're well known for. Uh, the um, Sumerians, they had the institution of religion started and they believe a lot of their city states were controlled by kind of like an army of priests um, that were like a theocracy. Uh, they had kings as well, but they think the religion played a major role in their city states. And they would build these huge temples. They were later called a, a, a ziggurat. Um, so they call it a temple tower or something like that. Uh, a lot of people refer to it as a like a type of mud brick type step pyramid because uh, they were made of mud brick. And uh, some were like maybe they may, may have been round shaped, but I think most of them were, if you go to a picture I've got here, most of them were probably square or really rectangular in shape uh, like this outline image. That's what they think they look like, um, cigarettes. And um, the word ziggurat is an Akkadian word uh, that means mountain of God. Uh, it's believed, I guess, where the gods resided uh, in their temple. And uh, if you know about the ziggurats, they would make them to look like mountains. They would put like trees on them and greenery. Uh, and uh, there's a theory that the um, Sumerians may have come originally from like a mountainous region, like maybe in Asia and migrate into the region. So that's why, hence the name or whatever. And uh, there's different examples, of course, of ziggurats. Uh, the most famous one that, of course, everybody's heard about is the Tower of Babel, which is in the Bible, in the book of Genesis. I believe it's Genesis 11. And, of course, the, the Bible, they tell the story about after the Great Flood, how uh, a bunch of workers, like the people, tried to build a huge tower uh, to heaven. And, of course, God got very angry about this. And um, he made all the workers speak different languages, different tongues, so they couldn't complete it. And so the word Babel was a word that meant um, confusion. It's like a Hebrew word. Uh, it's where the word Babylon comes from, or Babylonian, originated from the word. Um, and, um, of course, I believe that in the Bible that the original Tower of Babel was built by Nimrod, who was a great grandson of Noah. Uh, and um, they think it was destroyed. And they think there was another one built later that was called Intimanonki, which was like a Babylonian cigarette, which may have been built by the King Nebuchadnezzar. It's kind of debated about that. It, if it was built, it was built in the sixth century. Uh, but mostly, I think all that's left of the original. Uh, ziggurat that was there is just the bottom base of it, like the ruins of it. I, I think it's still there. So anyway, uh, talking about the, the Tower of Babel. So the Tower of Babel's one. Uh, then there's one that they've actually reconstructed today, uh, which is called the Great Ziggurat of Ur. Let me see if I can uh, find that one uh, here. There it is, the Great Ziggurat of Ur. Yeah, that one, of course, very famous, um, Great Ziggurat of Ur. And uh, it was, they think, built sometime in the 21st century B.C. 
Uh, there was a king that actually built it, uh, who I can put on the board for you. Uh, his name was um, King uh, Ur Namu. He was a Sumerian king. Uh, he was the one that constructed it, uh, 21st century BC. A lot of people consider him to be the first famous king, maybe, of Mesopotamia that they have. Uh, he was even known for having uh, some kind of law code system called the Code of Na Namu. It was like a code that was a precursor to uh, the Hammurabi Code of King Hammurabi. And uh, but he constructed it um, and um, was used like as his temple and probably like civic, civic center where he ran his state from. But what happened was after the Sumerians collapsed, the ziggurat um, fell apart, collapsed, and uh, nobody really knew much about it uh, until later. And then what happened was there was a um, famous, um, let me see if I can find him up here. His name was uh, Sir Leonard Woolley. You see right here, uh, Woolley was a famous ar British archaeologist. He came to Iraq uh, in, I think, the 1920s after World War One. He found the uh, site of Ur and its ziggurat, and he excavated it. Uh, and, uh, of course, he found uh, several tombs in it uh, that were buried inside of it. And over time, the, um, uh, the ziggurat was rebuilt. Um, Supposedly found, they believe, what is part of the um, House of Abraham uh, that's located there. I've got like the uh, picture of um, like the outside of, of the ziggurat of Ur. Uh, you can see like the facade and staircases. They were actually added later. Uh, and under uh, President Saddam Hussein, when he was uh, president of Iraq back in the 1980s, He's wanted to put that on the outside, so that's that's how they think uh, that the um, ziggurats look, but they're not really sure about that. That's just what well, they kind of look like in modern times. Yeah, they did have this. Uh, they did kind of rebuild what is the House of Abraham. Uh, they think that um, Sir Leonard Woolley may have found part of it, like I want to say the corner of it, or something like that. And later on, they kind of reconstructed what they think it looked like, but. They're not sure if that's really his house or not, but a lot of the Arabs claim it is, you know, that's that live in that area. So it might be. Um, and yeah, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, that's the other ziggurat. Hanging Gardens of Babylon, of course, the other famous ziggurat that's well known uh, that was built, they believe, in the 6th century B.C. Uh, they do think King Nebuchadnezzar constructed it. Uh, it's a famous uh, building that was built um, that they think now is one of the famous seven wonders of the world uh, that the Greeks write about a long time ago. And um, they think that Nebuchadnezzar built it for one of his queens. It was from Iran. And um, it was, they think it was around maybe 90 feet tall. At least that's what they theory on how tall it was. And it had like trees and greenery built on it. And they do think it had like these mechanical waterfalls where water would be brought to the top and would fall down. And so it was considered like a wonder of the world at the time. Uh, and it was around to maybe right, I think it existed up to the time of Alexander the Great. And it was falling apart. And Alexander tried to rebuild it, but it collapsed, they think, due to earthquakes. So... So that's around for like a couple centuries till maybe I want to say the fourth century. It's around, but it was one, originally one of the seven wonders of the world. So anyway, talking about um, some of the different ziggurats that they were known for building. And so a lot of these were built, like I said, from the Sumerian times down to the time of King Nebuchadnezzar. So over a period of like, I don't know, two, 3,000 years that they built these type of step pyramid temple towers. Uh, of course, like I said, the last thing the Sumerians need to talk about is the religion. Uh, yeah, the Sumerians were known for having numerous gods. Like most city-states usually had a chief deity or god that they worshipped as a whole. I'll kind of go through the main gods uh, that were very famous. 
Uh, the one that was the, originally the chief god of the Sumerians was the god An, A-N, uh, that was later called by the uh, Akkadians Anu, which is the name he's called later, A-N-U, Anu. Anu was like kind of considered like the king of the gods, the father of the Sumerian gods. And he ruled over the sky and the heavens. So a lot of, um, I guess, historians kind of consider Anu to be kind of comparable to the Greek god Zeus, or what they say, the Romans said as Jupiter later. So he's kind of seen as an equivalent uh, in, in the future. Uh, he is the father of two other gods later. Enki and Enlil are his sons. Uh, they are also famous gods in the pantheon of the Sumerians originally. Uh, Enki, originally called Ea, by the way, um, was mostly an earth-type god that was usually associated with water and also wisdom or knowledge. So he was an important god, so a son of Anu. And then Enlil was another son of Anu, who was like a wind god or air god. Uh, and he was usually associated with like things like storms and so on. So Anu was the sky, Enki was the water and earth, and then Enlil was like the wind or air. So it's kind of like almost comparable to like, you know, the Greek gods, you know, like um, Zeus, Hades, and Poseidon, you know, dividing up the world. And it was kind of seen as that, I guess, back then at the time. Uh, over time, there was another god that would kind of supplant or replace those other gods, which is the god Martuk. Um, he was like the son of the god Enki. He was like a Babylonian god of water and magic. And uh, he became the civic god of Babylon when you get down to the time, especially of um, King Nebuchadnezzar. It's like the chief god, uh, although the Assyrians worshipped him too um, as well. So over time, they have different gods uh, that emerge. They're kind of like a pantheon of gods that some, uh, some of them are kind of related to each other. Uh, like the Greek Roman gods are. And there's also goddesses. I didn't mention the goddesses and all that, but uh, there's all, all kinds of gods for different, you know, things in nature. The earth, the moon, the sun, the seas, uh, like in any other uh, early cultures. So that's basically, um, you know, about, about you know, the Sumerian culture uh, and all that. Now, we do need to talk about... Um, I think what else I got here? Uh, I didn't talk about the Epic of Gilgamesh. Let me go ahead and mention about that. That's the last thing I did not talk about, kind of out of order. But of course, yeah, the most famous thing that the you know Sumerians were known for in the end, besides cuneiform, is the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's of course one of the greatest stories ever told originally, besides the Bible, uh, and uh, it's the oldest recorded story in the world. Uh, it dates back 4,000 years or older. It's, it does predate the Bible, uh, by the way. It does tell the story of an ancient king of Iraq. You see here, he went by the name of Gilgamesh. Uh, he's also sometimes called Bilgamesh with a B. Uh, and um, so he was a king in southern Iraq, this city, U-R-U-K. And um, he, of course, is famous for a bunch of you know, adventures that he goes on. And uh, the most famous thing about, you know, Gilgamesh, if, if, as you know, is that it it's parallels a lot of the stories uh, in the book of Genesis, uh, especially the story of the great flood, uh, Noah's Ark. And so it is very, very similar. Uh, I told you that there's a lot of stories in Mesopotamia that are kind of similar uh, to that. Uh, and, um, there's even a case, I think, in the story where Gilgamesh even meets like a Sumerian Noah who tells them about the flood. And I think the story also goes and talks about how Gilgamesh was in search of like immortality, which he realizes in the end that only the gods can be immortal. So, so the Epic of Gilgamesh is, you know, one of the great stories. And uh, there's different versions of it. like the Akkadians, I think, had a version of it that was famous that they had. It was passed down to the Babylonians and the Assyrians. And so all those cultures pretty much knew about it. 
down to the time of the Babylonians. And that's probably where the Israelites may have got the, some of these ideas because they were, because the Israelites were in captivity at Babylon at one point. So anyway, just kind of talking about the Epic of Gilgamesh, um, which is one of the oldest stories ever told. All right, so enough about the Sumerians. Um, of course, we didn't really get into uh, and uh, talk about what happened to the Sumerians. I don't think we've mentioned that much about that. But the um, Sumerians over time uh, get conquered uh, by a people that's called the Akkadians and the Akkadian Empire. They were weren't around very long. Akkadians were like this short empire that was about, I think, around just 24th to about the 22nd century B.C., they're around for like maybe one or two centuries as a whole. And um, the founder of the Akkadian Empire uh, was a man named King Sargon, who you can see in that picture over there, in that statue right here. And um, he was considered their first king and founder. And uh, the Akkadians originated from central Iraq around a city called Akkad. It's like right above where Sumer is. Sumer's down here where the Sumerians were. And uh, what happened over time, sometime like around the 24th or 23rd century BC, the Akkadians conquered and absorbed the Sumerians into their empire. They became like one people, uh, basically. And so afterwards, um, the people that live in Mesopotamia are called like Akkadian Sumerian, is what they dubbed them. And um, the Akkadian Empire controlled multiple areas. They controlled uh, Elam, E-L-A-M, which is right here, Elam, Sumer, Akkad, an area in the north where Nineveh is and all this was later called Assyria up here. And this state went all the way from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean Sea. So it was a pretty much a massive empire. And the Akkadian Empire was considered, by the way, the first major empire in history. It may have been the first multi-ethnic multi or multinational empire, uh, but it was only short-lived. It didn't last long, uh, and eventually it broke up uh, within so many decades after uh, Sargon died. So I think it lasted, I want to say, 160 years, maybe. And then... Um, Iranian peoples that were like in the Sagros Mountains, which are over here in Iran right here, uh, came in and sacked the empire, and the empire collapsed uh, following that. So that's kind of a, in a nutshell, um, like the two, two states that were there. And then, of course, they merged uh, into two different states there. And uh, what happened after that uh, was that um, Mesopotamia and divided into like two spheres. One of the things that happened after the Akkadian period occurred, they had two spheres that would divide, like in that area you're looking at, which is right here, like in Iraq, uh, in that picture with uh, Sargon. And uh, the two spheres uh, were, I'll put it right here, upper, they had upper Mesopotamia first which included, it would later be called uh, Assyria, would be the name that they would dub it. And in the lower part, usually called Lower Mesopotamia, would be uh, what they call Babylonia. And the difference between the two uh, is that Babylonia would be like the southern part of Iraq, uh, like Iraq and Kuwait. And in the uh, upper, upper Mesopotamia, Syria, would be like uh, northern Iraq, uh, part of eastern Syria usually, and then also southeastern or southern, southern Turkey. That's about uh, the areas of, that made up where these two will come out of. And like Assyria will later have the Assyrian Empire, which will emerge there, the late Bronze, early Iron Age. And that, they're really one of the peak empires in Mesopotamia that you have, especially at the beginning of the Iron Age. Uh, of course, on the bottom, the lower part, the Babylonia, um, southern part, like around Babylon, 
Uh, you have like at least two states that emerge the most that are famous. Like you have the old Babylonian Empire or Paleo Babylonian Empire of King Hammurabi. That'll be there first. And later on, there's another one later called the uh, Neo or New Babylonian Empire, which is the uh, empire of King Nebuchadnezzar. Sometimes called the, Ch the Chaldean Empire, which I'll explain later what that is. And uh, that's how, that, how the areas kind of, um, you know, separate. And they think both of those states were kind of like those regions of Mesopotamia were kind of mostly in, related to like the Akkadian Sumerian peoples. Um, and so we'll get to the Babel. I don't think I got time to do the Babylonians today and all that. I was kind of short in the first lecture, but I'll talk about the Babylonians later. They're kind of related to them um, along with another group called the Amorites. I'll get to. And um, they'll kind of emerge next when I talk about that on Wednesday. And uh, but that's the bulk of the main stuff on the Akkadian Sumerian culture. Uh, that's there. Uh, let me go ahead and kind of do a better review. I know last time I didn't do a very good review. Well, look, I was missing a slide. Let's see if I could find it. Oh, there it is right there. So let me go ahead and review a little bit on the material we covered for this day today for both lectures. Um, so you got the first part of the study guide. I was missing that slide, so I put that in there for you. So it says, what is the term Mesopotamia in Greek? What two main rivers are located in Iraq? Well, the term Mesopotamia means, again, the land between the rivers. And, of course, the two rivers, of course, were the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. Uh, of course, Euphrates to the left and the Tigris to the right. And uh, so those two rivers that make up where Mesopotamia is, which Mesopotamia is mostly like around Iraq and areas that are kind of above it as well. Uh, other terms we talked about too. Fertile Crescent was another term I mentioned about Mesopotamia. Uh, fertile Crescent, of course, uh, was a term um, that was originally invented by that guy named James Henry Breasted to describe the fertile valleys of you know, Mesopotamia from like, you know, Iraq where Euphrates Tigris River is going all the way to the Jordan and the also the Nile River in Egypt. So it's kind of like those fertile areas. That's where all your great civilizations started that I talked about originally at the beginning of this lecture. Uh, cradle civilization is a nickname, modern nickname, of course, for uh, the fact that Mesopotamia is where the first civilization started. Like Sumerian, of course, which you know was probably one of the oldest. Uh, biblical stories associated with Mesopotamia. I told you like a bunch of them. The most faint, well, most famous is the Garden of Eden, uh, of course, story that's mentioned by, by the Sumerians and mentioned by the Bible, like Book of Genesis, as an example. Uh, the Tower of Babel, also as well. Uh, also mentioned about the flood story, which was actually before the Tower of Babel, but the flood, the great flood, the story of Noah's Ark. Uh, it's kind of comparable or parallels the Epic of Gilgamesh. And I think also I mentioned about Abraham, or the story of Abraham in the book of Genesis is you know another type of story that's associated with Mesopotamia as well. Uh, examples of Semitic peoples uh, that, that kind of live in that region of Mesopotamia. Yes, yeah, Semitic peoples, remember, were peoples that lived in southwestern Asia based on language groups, uh, languages that are written left to right. Actually, I'm sorry, I got it backwards. Right to left. Got that backwards for some reason. Right to left, excuse me. Yeah, right to left, not left to right. And um, anyway, uh, Hebrew, Arabic, um, are the main ones today that are written that way. And um, anyway, uh, other groups too, you can throw in there, uh, Akkadians, uh, Babylonians, Assyrians. Um, I think uh, Phoenicians, uh, you can throw in um, the uh, Chaldeans as well, which are like Nebuchadnezzar's people. So those are the main ones. Israelites are Jews, same people that they have. So yeah, right to left is the language like Arabic and Hebrew. Also Aramaic was another one too. That was a Semitic language. 
Uh, Indo-Europeans, of course, you know, Europeans can be written left to right or right to left, depends on what, which one it is. But um, Indo-European, Indo-Aryan uh, peoples or types of um, language type groups, peoples that originate from either Asia or Europe, and they're considered like Caucasian peoples. Uh, in Turkey, you had the Hittites, Iran, you had the Persians as examples. Greeks, Romans will later be like Indo-Europeans. Uh, who are the Sumerians? Sumerians were, of course, the first civilization to settle and develop Mesopotamia, mostly lived in southern Iraq. Sumer was the region of southern Iraq where their city-states were built. It was a Akkadian name uh, that was coined. Uh, the city-states that were the most famous were uh, the city of Aridu, Ur, and I told you Iraq, which is where King Gilgamesh came from. U-R-U-K. Cuneiform was the famous Sumerian writing system they developed, 3 4,000 B.C., and it was a type of language system where they wrote on clay tablets using like a stylus to make, you know, marks in it. And uh, it was a complicated language system which used many type of symbols which were logograms or some kind of type of alphabetic syllables. Uh, and um, they think they may have had 800 of them. Symbols are more at one point. Uh, cuneiform is the Latin term. It means wedge shape that became popular, I think, by the 18th century BC. And it was coined by, I think, different, I think in England or Britain, they, they coined it or whatever, and it became the popular nickname. They still call it today. Of course, Abbot Gilgamesh, I think one of the last things I lectured about out of order, but Abbot of Gilgamesh, of course, was considered to be the greatest um, story or thing written uh, in cuneiform, it's the oldest story ever told, uh, older than the Bible. Uh, it tells the story of the legendary king Gilgamesh or Bilgamesh, who was the king of Iraq in southern Iraq in Sumerian times. And um, it does have parallel stories with like the flood story, like the story of Noah and his ark uh, in the book of Genesis. So there's a lot of stories in Mesopotamia that discuss, you know, that, that there was a flood, which maybe there was one. Uh, other things we talked about, technology. I told you all kinds of things that the Sumerians invented, uh, you know, glass, bronze casting, the wheel, the chariot, sailboat, irrigation, may have developed the bronze plow, uh, the calendar system, math, um, engineering, architecture. Uh, they had a calendar system. They had like, um, they knew about the minute and time and the hour and all that. Like you saw in that short video. They had beer, my favorite. <laughs> uh, beer, a type of early alcohol uh, as well. Um, did I miss anything? Uh, organized religion, uh, the ziggurat, uh, early, you know, temples. Uh, were built by them. So they were known for build, uh, creating a lot of different inventions, uh, which a lot of people copied later. Uh, what were ziggurats? Ziggurats were these Sumerian-type step pyramids, temple towers. Uh, they were built in Mesopotamia and copied by other people. Ziggurats were, like I said, made of mud brick. Uh, and um, examples of some ziggurats uh, that they had, um, yeah, the great ziggurat of Ur, uh, of course, was one that was, they think, a real one, Tower of Babel, which in Timonaki may have been a later version of it. Um, and, of course, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. So those are all different examples of ziggurats that were famously built. Uh, of course, the one that uh, we talked about a little bit about, um, the great ziggurat of Ur, or ziggurat of Ur, uh, was discovered by Sir Leonard Woolley in the 1920s. This was a ziggurat that was built by the Sumerian king, which was um, ur -Namu, And that may have been one of the oldest ziggurats built originally. I think it dates back to the 21st century BC. They've rebuilt it, uh, which I think at the time of Saddam Hussein in the 1980s, they kind of added a facade and staircase to it. 
Uh, the other ziggurats I told you about, Tower of Babel is a biblical type ziggurat, which the Antemananki may have been like a biblical, like a later version, they think, that they think King Nebuchadnezzar built. And I told you King Nebuchadnezzar also, they think, built the hanging gardens of Babylon, which may have been one of the original seven wonders of the world mentioned by the Greeks. Uh, what were the three main gods of the Sumerians? What were, they, uh, what were their attributes and all that? Uh, I told you that the uh, highest uh, Syrian, highest um, Sumerian god was Anu. Anu was like a sky god or god of the heavens, kind of like a Zeus type god. So he's their greatest god. He had two sons, Enki and Enlil. Enki was like kind of like a water god, a god of the earth. And he had a brother named Enlil, who was like a wind god, air god, storm god. And um, so they kind of broke up the world uh, between them. That was sort of like almost like a triad or trinity of gods, kind of like Zeus, Poseidon, Hades, you know, or something like that. And the um, Babylonians had a very popular god that they liked, which was uh, the god Martuk, worshipped at Babylon. And he was the god of like magic water. Uh, he was a son of Enki. And um, he became real, real popular by the time of the Assyrians and Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, then you had the Akkadians came in. The Akkadians, you know, conquered the Sumerian Empire. Excuse me, excuse me, Sumerian states that were there and merged them together uh, into like one national type empire. And so they've become like the Akkadian Sumerian peoples. And uh, this empire emerged about the 24th century BC, and it's around till maybe the 22nd century BC, somewhere around that time, maybe about less than 200 years. And the king that founded it, I told you, was King Sargon of Akkad, which was their capital in central Iraq. And he was considered like the first great king to control a vast empire. And like I said, the Akkadian Empire may have been the first empire in the world. It was definitely one of the first um, multinational empire because it had like Sumerians, Akkadians, and other peoples that were under it. Uh, but their empire collapsed. And then, of course, like I said, the other groups came in, like the Babylonians and Syrians and so on. And uh, I don't really have time to cover, I think, the rest of that material today. It's probably too much anyway. For today, but that's pretty much it uh, for the lecture material um, on like the early Sumerian culture. I'll finish up with Babylonia uh, later. Uh, let me know if you have any questions or comments um, about the lecture uh, overall. Uh, remember, uh, you know, people forget about this, um, but you do get bonus points, you know, for sending me comments. Uh, ask me questions on my YouTube channel. So just, you know, go to the actual lecture that's on there and put a comment in um, about about the lecture. And um, what else, too, before I go, um, I'll put that on the screen for you. But um, remind you, uh, the Canvas quiz number one on prehistory, that's, of course, going to be due next Monday, September 7th. So make sure you go to quizzes. And, of course, take that. Other reminders, too, don't forget uh, book reports. Anybody you know, know what book they're doing, send me the book, your title, email it to me. Um, I don't know if anybody's not sending me the contract policy page, but send that to me, too, as well. And if any, anybody also is interested in that uh, veterans project, the oral history project, let me know. I've got nine or ten people already signed up for it. If you're interested in that, let me know. And so that's it for today. Send me some questions or whatever, uh, but but I'll uh, see y'all later. Y'all take care. Uh, I guess be safe and all that, but send me comments, send me questions, okay?